So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the event. So welcome to Startup Grind. So and the fireside chat with Startup Founders series. I'm Kazuki. The, um, I'm a regular host at Startup Grind Osaka. So we Startup Grind is the largest startup community uh, in the world, connecting and inspiring people, uh, including entrepreneurs, investors, and all the business persons to create the uh, startup ecosystem. So tonight's event is called Reimagining Japanese Work Culture Through Startup with Paul Chapman, CEO and founder of Monetary. And here's the very simple agenda. So I'm going to introduce tonight's guest shortly, and we're going to have a fireside chat about 40 minutes. And after that, we're going to have a Q&A session. And you can post your questions on Q&A box. Uh, so um, I think the Q&A box is your right hand side of your screen. So if you have any questions, please post anytime during the session. And I will pick up some questions from Q&A box during Q&A sessions. So next slide. So tonight, uh, we are inviting Paul Chapman, CEO and founder of Monetary. So one of the leading fintech startup in Japan. So prior to founding current startup, he served as IT director at MWorld. And he was also running a SaaS startup in Australia. So he has lots of experiences both in startups and corporates. So tonight we're gonna to discuss how he started his, his business in Japan, what gaps and challenges he faced in Japan, and a piece of advice for entrepreneurs who are doing the business in Japan or the people about to start the business in Japan. Yep. So, Paul, uh, can you introduce yourself and the, your business in Japan and uh, milestones, etc.? Sure. Well, I didn't prepare any slides because slides are boring. So I thought okay. that story. <laughs> Stories are exciting cool. and slides are boring. That's the that's the, uh, the the sum total of my learning of the last nine years of pitching pitching VCs. I, I was talking to my wife the other day. I said, "Oh my God, I've been pitching VCs for almost ten years in my career. I must be an expert by now." Um, it's been interesting. We've learned a lot. But l let me start by telling you a little bit about Money Tree. So we refer to ourselves as Japan's number one financial data platform. We provide data that's essential for digital transformation, fintech, and artificial intelligence. Basically, all of these new revolutions in technology re require access to data. But to get access to data, you need trust and you need consent. And more and more, these are, well, these are required by law. The consent piece is a very important one. So we live in a world where, <laughs> where a lot of data is looked after for us by advertising platforms. And I'm not against advertising at all. After all, I'm wearing an advertisement right now. Um, <laughs> walking billboard. I used to have a bigger one. I used to call it the billboard T-shirt for being on stage. But um, since everyone's in this very, in this very cozy atmosphere, I can wear a small one. But I'm not against advertising. However, we do want to know who's using our data and how how it's being put to work and who they're sharing it with. And so this has been a theme from before. Uh, I started Money Tree with my co-founders, uh, Mark Macdad and Ross Sharrett. Um, I've been interested in, in privacy and, and in data. So when we started Money Tree, we started with a very basic thesis. The hypothesis was this, banking experience in Japan sucks. We really didn't like it. Now, it's not to say that banking wasn't good customer, didn't provide good customer service. If you went to a branch, in some ways it was really good if, when, you, when, when they call out your number and you got to go to the front. But we lived in a country that had ATMs that would shut at 6 p.m. And we were like, why? And so, you know, we put up with this for a long time. And of course, it was very stable, the banking system in Japan, very reliable. And these are things that were, that were uh, valued. However, around 2011, we thought, well, we've got these great things called iPhones and apps, and we've been building them for a bunch of years now. We moved from web apps to mobile apps. That's a different story. That was a funny story. The first app we designed looked terrible because we thought it should be like a website. <laughs> it's okay. The, the end of that story is we won Best App Award twice from Apple. Uh, but yeah, humble beginnings. However, before Money Tree, we thought, look, let's make an app that could combine the data from all of the different financial institutions that you might have 
uh, you know, in your wallet, all the different credit cards and, and uh, ATM cards and have it in one beautiful experience. And we thought if we solve this problem, we could act as a bridge between financial institutions and their customers. And we thought we'd be this technology enabled bridge that would just make it much better for everyone. And somehow blah, blah, blah data was very important. But more important than that, consent, transparency, privacy, security were very important to us. So we killed it on the product side of things. We were the world's first mobile only financial app that was connected to bank accounts. So you could get apps that, you know, you register on a website, download it and then log in. We went, no, let's go, let's go full mobile, no website except you know, the one that says download it from the App Store. And as a result, we were promoted by Apple very, very heavily. We thought if Apple liked what we did, maybe they'd promote us once. We were promoted for 18 months solid. On launch day, we got 5,000 uh, 5, registrations, which have caused problems because we'd never had 5,000 real people come through the system, only, only tens of thousands of simulated people, and it was a bit different. We hit a few rate limits on the Amazon Web Services uh, that were underlying our service, uh, like within a few hours. And we had to call Seattle to say, please increase the rate limit because we were using the technology in a way that they hadn't imagined that it would be used. Um, we became one of the largest users of, uh, of what's called Simple Workflow on Amazon AWS after Amazon because they use it internally a lot. Uh, it seems only Amazon and MoneyTree use that a lot. Uh, we were the biggest user of the Heroku platform in Japan at some point, but we killed it on the product side, but we had no revenue model because <laughs> we thought, look, we're going to find it. It's got to be here somewhere. This is such a, an important problem. And we started out thinking, well, maybe we could do advertising or affiliate advertising. And very soon we realized that the growth mechanics of an app, of a, a finance app, where you never say to someone, hey, look at how much money I've got in my cool app. No one ever said that. So, well, no one I know. Um, if you want to show off how much money you have, unlike us founders, <laughs> you'll go and uh, you'll buy a car or something and drive that around, you know, a Ferrari, but you don't show them your app. And so we didn't have these viral growth mechanics that we'd hoped for. We got a million installs with almost no marketing budget, thanks to promotion by the Apple App Store. Um, by building something really, that sh really powerful that showed the power of their platform, they promoted us. However, we had to find a business model and we went into, and this is an interesting part of the story. Have you heard of the Valley of Death? Um, the Valley of Death is where, or a death spiral. So between seed round, we raised a big seed round of about $1.5 million, which was big in 2013. And, for, and, not, and we weren't in Silicon Valley, we were here. Um, between that and Series A, we, we couldn't find investors. Uh, our existing investors put a bit more money in. Uh, there was a point when the founders, we stopped taking salary for a couple of months. We we're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And I remember thinking at the time, the one thing I want to do is keep doing this because it's so much fun. Like we're actually building something valuable for so many people and it's so necessary, but we have to find a way to make money from it. We thought of, well, actually we didn't think of this. We, we got approached by people to just sell raw data. And we're like, no, we're not going to do that. Kazuki, we, got, we took your name off your data and we just sold it to a bunch of people, but please trust us. So that's not acceptable in our world. If you're going to do something like that, you need to guarantee privacy, not just take someone's name off it. So we didn't do that. And lastly, we got approached by a few accounting software companies who said, please give us your aggregation platform because we're competing against this company called Free and we need to have, we need aggregation. And no one else has got what they've got except you guys. And we're like, well, okay, but we don't do that, so no. And we said no, maybe two times. <laughs> And then on the third time, I was like scratching, you know, it's like maybe working with these, with the accounting software vendors, we can be trusted enough for the banks to use us. And we just assumed that banks would never use our API. Never. We thought they would use our app and somehow we would integrate with their APIs, but we would never provide data to them directly because they just wouldn't trust us. And it turned out that hunch was correct. So Yayoi is an accounting software company. Uh, they're actually the biggest in cloud. Um, because they were the biggest in desktop. I think second to them is free and then money forward. And so Yayoi became our first client. TKC, the biggest tax accounting software company most of you have never heard of, became our, 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 also our first, well, equal first client. They started in the same month. And they're still two of our biggest uh, users of the service. And from there, we got investment from Salesforce. We were the first company to get investment from all three mega banks uh, through their venture funds. This is the first time in history they invested side by side. 
with one of them, and I won't say who, we had to convince them that I wouldn't go home. <laughs> with another one, we had to convince them that there's more than one fintech, and if you've invested in one fintech already, that's good, but that doesn't mean you're done, and you can invest in a second one, because <laughs> we were the second one. Um, and the third one, well, we actually, they, we'd been talking to them for years, uh, and I, I think it was probably the longest the longest engagement in history. We were dating for a long time, and then finally, we, 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 we didn't get married, but well, they invested. And so that saved the company. And there was some there was some fast foot workers there as well because we, we got a yes from from the lead investor, but they said you can't have, touch the money until the round closes. And we're thinking, well, these are mega banks. We're gonna it's gonna take months. And I thought we'll be dead by then. So we, we cut a deal really quickly, which I'll tell you about one day, uh, not today, where we promised to somehow get them the money back if the round didn't close. And it all worked out amazingly. Like so many things could have gone wrong. So post Series A, we then get money from SBI. Um, we got money from a company called Bailey Gifford. They're an equities investor. They're one of the top three long hold public market investors in the world. And we're their only private investment in Japan, which is pretty funny because I had no idea who they were. So there's, all, there's been all these serendipitous things, but there's been a lot of doors slammed in our faces as well. So Money Tree Link today has over 63 enterprise clients. More than half of them are financial institutions, including Mitsubishi UFJ Bank, uh, Mitsubishi Sumitomo Bank Corporation, Mizuho Bank, Mitsubishi UFJ Nikos, which is the largest credit card issuing group in Japan. Uh, we have some cool startups, like maybe you've heard of Wealthnavi, maybe you've heard of Tornatech. Wealthnavi is a listed company worth over a billion dollars. Uh, Tornatech, those guys are still private. We have great hopes for them as well. Another Australian founder, hi Justin. Um, we're helping create value in an ecosystem that is just getting started. Open banking started here last year. In Australia, it's kind of still not starting. That's my home country. Mm. So we've done this amazing thing and we've done it. And I'll, this is the, the, the final part of the story I'll leave you with. It's kind of, it says a lot about how we've positioned ourselves. So we're foreign founders in Japan. And in the early days, and because we're not on TV, I'll use this word. We were shit scared that, you know, we'd get in trouble if we did something wrong. That if we did it wrong, they'd kick us out of the country. We could never come back to the country that we love, but we just, we're not from here. And so, you know, we thought we have to be number one in privacy, number one in security. We have to take it more seriously than everyone else. We can't just say, oh yeah, give lip service to it and then we're an advertising platform. We're not telling you really how we're using your data. We had to do everything really black and white. And so we also positioned ourselves as the most transparent, the most trustworthy player in the space by just making it very simple. We don't advertise to you. We only share your data with who you tell us to share it with. We stop sharing it when you tell us to. If you want to delete your account that deletes all the data from our system, the end, it's simple. The world that we're building for, even though we've been at this for almost 10 years, is just getting started. So in some ways, this is still day one for FinTech in Japan. Most of you probably don't use a FinTech service. There are almost no neobanks or challenger banks in Japan. There are a couple of kind of neobanks. Cash is, I think, the first one that's starting in Japan. Um, which is started by my friend Shinichi Takatori. Uh, I think Revolut has arrived, but I don't know anyone who's using it. <laughs> uh, there are probably some, but of course they're big overseas. So we're really just getting started. I think the vanguard of it, of, uh, of FinTech is really probably companies like PayPay and LinePay because they have so much money behind them. And that's great because that brings attention to the ecosystem. But there's a whole constellation, a galaxy of different service providers. And MoneyTree as the only open, platform for providing access to financial data is really the prime choice for these companies to choose and for banks as well. We're not trying to provide financial services. We're not trying to compete with every fintech under the sun. We're just trying to do this thing, this one thing, the data, trust and privacy component really, really well so that everyone can use that. And I, and it's, it's funny, but that's not a very common thing for Japan. It's common for Silicon Valley, um, but Japan is getting with it. Japan is interested in platforms. People want to build without having to build everything themselves because reinventing the wheel is very costly. So yeah, it's an exciting, been an exciting nine something years at MoneyTree. The next 10 should be hopefully a lot more exciting. <laughs> That's my story. Hopefully it was all right. Okay. No jokes, but it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I understood that the, um, your product is addressing the, uh, the problem is Japan have, yeah, like uh, yeah, there's a lot of in ine in inefficiency uh, in the banking area, and the I mean in Japan as well, 
<laughs> in general because the Japanese company is moving very slow and the yeah, speed is a key, right? Obviously, uh, for startups. And Japanese companies also like don't take risks. And the yeah, it's good or bad, right? Uh, of course. Yeah, maybe bad portion, yeah, speed and the don't take risk, but the good portion is the quality of the business. Yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, banking industry has uh, such a, a kind of stable infrastructure and it's a very um, high quality and the other services uh, area as well. Yeah, but um, uh, I personally think that Japan is not really, um, you know, business friendly country. Uh, I, I mean, my friend told me that the, um, he wanted to open a bank account for his business in Japan and it took like uh, five or six months. But he, it, when he went to Singapore, uh, he could open the bank account for two days. So I, I think that Japan is not really a um, business friendly uh, in terms of like a speed and the government and the, yeah, also like a lot of paperwork uh, still like a Hanko cultures, et cetera. So there's a lot of inefficiency and the unfriendliness uh, from the business perspective. So uh, I wanted to ask that the, uh, the question, uh, my question is, why did you choose Japan? Yeah, because there's lots of countries in the Asia and the world, but the, why Japan? Uh, I, I think Paul, you are on mute. Myself because I, I heard this background noise. I wasn't sure it was my, my side. Um, that's a good question. So I, I first came to Japan uh, as a high school student to learn the language. And I thought this would be a hard language to learn. Sounds like fun, interested in the culture. I didn't know much more about Japan because it was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, in those days, it was hard to find information about Japan when you were living overseas. Not like today. There's just so much out there. Just not get on YouTube, bang, you know everything, almost. So when I got my first job in Japan, I used to change I used to change trains to go to work. I think it was Kayabacho Station. And there was always this poster on the wall that said, wa monozukuri no kuni, which is like, sorry, that's the sort of, that's how I read it in my head. Um, that's not how I actually speak when I talk to you, speaking Japanese. <laughs> so it means Japan is a country of making things. And I thought, yes, Japan is really good at that. And oh my God, the software experiences suck. And it took me a while to understand why that was. It wasn't, you know, I didn't just think, well, it's just bad. It didn't make sense. Great engineers, great designers, bad software. And then I realized, well, there's a reason for that. And that's that risk aversion. People don't want to make decisions when they think that, well, they don't have all the information. So there's an abundance of information needed before you can make a decision. If you apply for anything, you'll see on the application form, there'll probably be two, two <laughs> even if it's a one pager, there'll be another page showing you how to fill it in. And even after living in Japan for a while as a foreigner, I thought, well, I'm doing the same thing. I'm not, I'm checking, I'm double checking, I'm triple checking because I'll have to fill it in again from scratch if I get it wrong. I've gone through that experience many times and my handwriting is terrible. So I hate having to do it again. <laughs> so risk aversion from, you get taught, get it right. And so I thought there needs to be more of a, a, a sense of how Japan can use software. And this is over 10, 12 years ago we're talking about. And so at the time I thought, I know what I can do. I can start a software company in Japan. I've already started one and that had been acquired by Thomson Reuters at the time. Um, but I started that in Australia and the UK. And that was an early, early SaaS business. Before the word SaaS even existed, we, we didn't call it SaaS. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna make my next company in Japan somehow, somewhere. And I spoke to a friend of mine who, who was a Japanese guy who had studied at Monash University where I graduated. Um, I also studied at Saitama University. And he, he, I asked him, if you started a business, what would your parents say? And then, and he said, oh, they'd say, why can't you get a real job? <laughs> and I said, but isn't your dad like self-employed? Like he, he started his shacho of his own company. Yeah. <laughs> so despite being the son of an entrepreneur, his parents would have been disappointed that he had started a business. And this was, I think, 2006, seven, eight. So I was just like scratching my head. So when the smartphone boom started and the iPhone came out, I'm like, oh, I definitely want to do my next startup with, st with smartphones. And I started the business with a few friends from Japan who were Americans living here. Because in my first startup, I'd had such a bad relationship with my co-founders. I mean, we were all immature, I was 23. It's like a bad marriage ending in divorce. So I wanted to marry good people the second time around. 
my current co-founders, we've been working together for 15 years this year. So good marriage, business marriage. At the time, I remember thinking there's no one else I'd rather start a company with other than you two. And we thought, look, we could start in the US, we could start in Japan, Australia, not such a big market, nice, nice to hang out there for a bit. So it's one of the two. We didn't, know, we didn't speak Chinese, but we speak Japanese pretty fluently. And we thought in America, well, that's good. But in Japan, we have this advantage. We know so much about the technology. And it seems that in 2011, 2012, not many people knew about smartphones. So we thought we'd have an advantage. And that turned out to be the only advantage we had. <laughs> because at the time, being a foreigner, it was a case of, I, I can describe this the way my business advisor, she's a former investment banker, Natasha, she would she explained it to me like this. She said, Paul, being a foreign business person in Japan is like being a woman in business anywhere else. You're constantly explaining why you're there. Everyone assumes that you know, you're not very good at what you do. Um, you've got to prove yourself by being twice as good as, as everyone else who's already there. And you're always fighting for attention because people underestimate you. And I thought, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> and so I'd say, yeah, it's hard. Startups are hard anywhere. It was it felt twice as hard for us because we didn't have the right pedigree. We weren't from the right place. People underestimated us, but we let our product speak for itself. And that gave us legitimacy, which allowed us to then build a business. It didn't build the business for us. Like the product did not make the business. It stopped us from getting basically shut out completely. And that that was the foot in the door that we needed. So we saw this opportunity to help Japan. We saw this opportunity to make software in a country that wasn't good at software. And we saw this opportunity to, as I said about banks, to provide a better experience for all of us bank customers. Um, and it's taken nine years to make the first step, which is to create the platform that banks are using. The next nine or 10 years will be pushing that out into the ecosystem so that we're all enjoying much better experiences. For example, not having to wait six months to get a bank account. That's something that could be improved if we could somehow take your, your reputation as an individual in Japan, showing all that data that represents, you know, how trustworthy you've been, how, how diligent you've been in paying your bills or, or earning money and roll that into your brand new company that has zero history, for example. So we see ourselves as being a force for good where we can do something that if we don't do it, we're not really sure if other people would do it the same way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I want to hear more about your kind of uh, challenges um, you faced mm. when, you, when you're doing the business in Japan. Sure. So, uh, is there like any gaps or difficulties? Uh, I mean, compared to uh, your home country, easy. Or... so easy, yeah. surprising. Like you know, hardly any, barely an inconvenience. No, it was very hard. <laughs> Sorry, Australians like being sarcastic. Um, you know, so what was hard? I'd say that looking back, the hardest thing wasn't being a foreigner. It was having the wrong pedigree not having friends who are venture capitalists, you know, who would invest in us at the, at the, on, from the very start or introduce us to all their friends, not having friends in the banking sector who would introduce us to their, you know, their bucho, kacho, shacho, that would help us. So that's like a department head or section head or company head, you know, CEO. We, we just didn't have the networks at all. We had one connection and that was our chairman, Jonathan Epstein. And so, sorry, Jonathan Epstein, he was, he didn't have like ideal connections, but way better than ours. So he knew a few VCs. He knew some people in the credit card space. Um, serendipitously, we met people who joined, got behind our cause and introduced us to different people. A VC here and there took, kind of took pity on us. <laughs> um, some just never wanted to see us again. There is a certain kind of VC that just does not invest in probably if we were foreigners doing a different kind of business, they probably would have invested, but we were foreign and doing a weird business. It wasn't an advertising business back in 2012, 2000 tech, ad tech, ad tech, ad tech. And all VCs were always talking about in time machine effect and investing in Southeast Asia. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to Japan? No one's investing here. All these institutions will have money and then there'll be no services and people won't have jobs. So that isn't the case today. But I was like, oh, this is pretty terrible. The hard thing for us was being like odd ducks An odd duck, you know, we, we st stood out and it wasn't seen as a good thing. And the interesting thing is the US ecosystem has become a lot more like Japan. 
So there's this there's this saying that I like to refer to. Japan is so far behind, we're ahead. So even though Japan has this sort of, you know, elite status, if you've gone to this school or this company and you know these people and you've gone to an American business school, we didn't have any of that. Our, our chairman went to Harvard, so I kind of borrowed his, <laughs> his reputation. Um, and we use that to create our own reputation. But that's actually what it's, be it's become more like that in the US, not less like that. So this idea that it's open because you've got accelerators and they're angels, that's true. But you, but if you want to, if you, you, you can get ahead further with a bet with like a reputation of having in a famous school or working in a famous company, and if that sounds boring to you, I'd I'd recommend find a mid stage startup that looks like it's already doing well. Where you learn a lot of things, and then leverage that reputation for, to become a founder. I, my biggest mistake was not was thinking that I'd already exited once, and that was a, that was a good validator of our ability to do it again. Uh, it wasn't enough because it wasn't in Japan. So that was one thing, being the wrong type. Now, this is not a Japan is not fair type of thing, not at all. VCs and investors everywhere pattern match. So if you don't fit the pattern, you have to think about how to make that work. So until we had a Japanese CFO, it was hard for us to raise money. And our first CFO was fantastic, very talented guy, um, jack of all trades. And then our, our current CFO, he's also fantastic, but for a different stage of money tree. And so that's one of the things that uh, was hard at the start was, just convincing one Japanese person to join our company, we didn't want to ask people, please join, because we thought, well, we're so unstable, we might mess up your career. <laughs> and in 2012, 2013, that was still like startups were a dead end for a lot of people, unless it was like a, a runaway success. We didn't know how successful we'd be. So we were reluctant to ask people to join who weren't, who, sorry, who were Japanese. We were scared. So the ones who joined were the ones who just, said, yeah, we'll join. We didn't ask them to. <laughs> um, and so they were in, so our first two Japanese staff members were actually, uh, they were consultants, I guess you could say they were, they were contractors and they were doing their own thing and they helped us with our thing. And they're still at Money Tree and they're both director level people now because they you know so much about the industry and they're so talented. But we never, until I think 2015, I didn't ask them to become seishain or full-time employees because up until that point, I was still too worried. <laughs> And that was post Series A, so it took us a while. So the hard part was being from outside, having the wrong pedigree for a, what's considered a successful startup founder. Um, what was hard was being able to pull people in who we knew, because we mostly only knew foreigners, and the Japanese people that we met, we were reluctant to hire them. And now the third thing, and this this is just like this is just conservative old Japan. I mean, shogunai, as they say. Um, I'll give you an example. We had three or four million dollars in the bank, and we were working out of a co-working space. And the uh, the Hoshogaisha, the the guarantee company, would not cover <laughs> three months' worth of rent on one more room in our shared office. Oh and it, because they said like, <laughs> we can't take on more risk, and I'm like, what risk? We have millions of dollars in the bank. Look at who our investors are. Oh, we're very sorry. We can't take on more risk. So I spoke to the landlord. I said, can I just pay like, you know, what's the notice period? Three months. We'll pay three months extra deposit. Okay, done. Done. So it just pissed me off. It's, I mean, it's one of those things. And this is where, this is where Japan is, has, has struggled. And I think it will, it's changing because of generational change and out of necessity. But Japanese customer service is wonderful if it fits within a certain uh, range of expected behaviors and outcomes. And when something goes outside that, there's no way to deal with that. And that's the problem of having, you know, someone at the top who makes all the decisions and everyone else just hoping to you know, please that person. And so I think I'm, we are seeing a change in the way that organizations are being built, um, especially, you know, Japanese startups are a lot flatter than they used to be. Uh, you've got, you know, chuto sayo, so mid-career hires across the board, um, especially when they're full of young people as well. Well, they, they've never really experienced some of these things. So I think it is changing, but that lack of, I won't call it lack of flexibility, adaptability. Flexibility, these people want to change. It's like, oh, I want to help you, but I can't because the rules are the rules and the process is set. So lack of adaptability is a huge frustration in the early stage, but now it's, it's probably very, very different. There's the Tokyo Metropolitan Governments um, and Jetro have also have a, like they both have offices, I think in the same building on the same floor to help startups and pe help people 
you know, build a business here. It's not as easy as Singapore, but the market here is much, much bigger than Singapore. It's harder to raise money than Singapore, but everyone is in Singapore. It's a red ocean. It's so easy to go to Singapore that you're going to have 10 companies all doing the same thing. And how are you going to differentiate yourself for a country of what, three or 4 million people? You have 128 million people here. So on the one hand, it's more challenging. On the other hand, it can be a more favorable environment. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I agree that the uh, Japanese companies are more like a care about like a trust or relationship, right? So like, um, yeah, connections, network, trust, re reputation, yeah, those kind of things are very important. Absolutely. As well as the yeah, technical uh, capabilities and the yeah, also innovations and stuff. So, but but was there like uh, any other problems like uh, in like a tech, technical side because the financial industry in Japan is known for like a very old infrastructure mm. and the it, uh, when it comes to implementation I assume it's the very difficult yeah I, I, um, yeah on, on top of the uh, building the relationship mm -hmm. also implementation is very hard it's, and also yeah. like um, yeah hiring point of view uh, the hiring engineers right so it's the kind of a startup and the innovative products, yeah, the hiring engineers, and also I assume it's very hard. So how, how, how's that? How's that points? Uh, I mean, when you raise enough venture capital, hiring is not as hard as it looks. Um, keeping people can be hard. Um, you know, I've seen companies raise way more money than us, and they have a lot of trouble keeping their people. Um, you know, and when they eventually solve that problem, well, then they, they spend less on recruiters. Um, for us, you know, we've got people come and go for the different reasons. Sometimes you see people leave and you really wish they'd stayed and maybe we could have done something in time. Um, other times, uh, you know, you get a good run with someone and it's their time to move on to something else. Hiring is not the greatest. So the, the founders of Money Tree worked in, we all met at uh, a company called N World. N World is a, is a, subsidiary of N Japan, which is you know the largest job site in Japan. And we worked there because in those days, <laughs> there were no tech jobs that you could get, except even Rakuten wasn't really hiring foreigners then. Um, there weren't really tech jobs for people who came from overseas outside of investment banking. Um, even if you had uh, JLPT1 or now JLPT N1, which I, I, my, I have and my co-founder has, vanishingly few job opportunities at the time. So we joined, I, I actually, I, I joined that company because they were my recruiter <laughs> and I hated recruiters. Oh, they, oh, I hate recruiters, I don't trust them. And they were really trustworthy and I was really impressed with the, the culture of the company. And I thought, well, I could learn how to, I could learn about business here. And I did. Um, and in fact, that company was acquired, became N World, and uh, the founder of that company became one of our angel investors. But the, um, so I got a little bit off track here. Um, hiring people wasn't hard because we got experience at that company. So when we had money and we could afford recruiters, we knew how to run a really solid process. Uh, you know, I've gone through lots of interviews. I reckon I could be a CHRO or at least at least chief talent acquisition officer for another company, having done so many interviews and gone through you know so much of that. But what has been truly hard is mapping st what startups value to what customers value. And startups value very different things, or tech startups value di different things to banks. And even though banks think they want a lot of those things, often only the people that interact with the startup want that, the rest of the bank doesn't. A bank, a, a major financial institution is not just one thought, one idea. It's a, a, it's a fiefdom of competing interests. People want different things. And you've got the system team and the digital team, and then you've got the you know you've got the retail team, and then you've got the corporate team, and okay, it's all very complex. And you know, working with banks, for example, we all had to connect via API. So open banking, we got registered with the FSA, and that was that was very thorough. Lots of spreadsheets, lots of disclosure, lots of documentation to say like what we do. I mean, we are regulated now, not for financial services, but like an ad, an adjunct to financial services. Um, so, you know, there's this expectation that if, you know, you're, we're like a, we're like a, we're like critical infrastructure to some extent, not like an ATM, <laughs> but similar, you know, if something goes down or something goes wrong, report on it, tell us what happened, keep track of that. So that was a change in our culture. 
Um, but connecting to all these bank APIs, an API is an application programming interface. So it's a way for, you know, for us to connect to their servers and to be able to request information on behalf of one of their customers. Varying levels of difficulty from a commercial aspect, from technical aspect, some of them want to charge a lot of money. Some of them are very kind and don't want to charge much. They just want to help their customers. Um, some of them you get, you wonder whether or not they really care about their customers, the way that they act. Um, but I think they do, but they care. they see us as a, they see FinTech and APIs as just as a threat, not as a benefit. Um, yeah. So it's a real mix. And so, and being a, the smallest of the major data aggregation companies, so Free and Money Forward have like nearly a thousand staff. They're both worth billions of dollars. We're much smaller. <laughs> and so, you know, they compare us at, a same at the same level and we have barely as many resources, uh, nowhere near as many resources. So it's been challenging to maintain those relationships and to get things right. And this is in a culture of zero tolerance of defect. So we, you talk, you, Kazuki, you mentioned before banks care about, about quality, right? A certain kind of quality they care a lot about. Safety they do, convenience they don't, like not that much. You know, safety is way more important. The number one, the number one client of most banks is the regulator because the regulator can shut them down. The second is, is the, probably the shareholders, the business. The third is the customer. Now, the individual sales staff think, you know, differently, but as an organization, they're the priorities that come out. You know, individuals care about their customers. The company, which is lots of different people and the result of what, they, what they're motivated by is that regulator one, business two, customer three. And so, you know, it's okay to put a lot of, you know, we've borrowed money a couple of times from some very lovely banks <laughs> um, along the way. Thank you. I won't say who. Um, oh, my God, there's so much paperwork. I mean, it's like a stamping party. Like the table was cu is just covered with contracts and it's like, write your name here and stamp here. And, I, you know, I, I went to university in Japan. I, I used to be able to write. I can barely write my address now. And I've got really easy kanji for my address. I'm like, no, it's like meguro. Like that's easy kanji. <laughs> And uh, nonetheless, I struggle these days. I can type fluently. It's fine. I can, I can read, write contracts. I just can't write by hand. But there's yeah. just so much hema, so much friction, and, uh, and they put that onto the customer. And look, it's, this is banks everywhere. And fintech is about making services that put the customer first, not the regulator, not the bank. And that's the challenge. And so helping banks understand that if they don't do this, if they fall back on their old habits, then the pay pays of the world or the money forwards of the world will happily give them loans and become, you know, their new financial institution. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, regulators are, you know, uh, the customers uh, for banks. <laughs> it, it, it's very unique and special uh, in this in particular industry. Yeah, it's right, very special. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, look, it's, it's challenging, it's challenging. One thing that we've really learned through a lot of the mistakes and sometimes apologies, bow very deeply. Um, it's okay to make mistakes, but you have to fix them. You know, you have to do what's called <laughs> which is um, prevent recurrence of this mistake. Um, how are you going to make this not happen again? And that is very important. I, I don't mind making mistakes if they're reversible. I hate making the same mistake over and over. That's just ridiculous. Um, and banks hate that too. We have that in common, but ultimately, Banks are trying to provide a very important service. They're they are critical infrastructure for the economy. And if we're supporting them, you know, we have to help them achieve their goals. At the same time, we exist as a platform to help their customers achieve their goals. But we work through banks who work through fintechs to do that. So it's, uh, you know, we have our own app, but we're not an app company anymore. We're a platform as a service in the same way that Amazon AWS or Stripe are platforms that power other people's solutions. Money Tree, ours is called Money Tree Link. Money Tree Link is a platform as a service. That's like 95% of our business. Cool. Yep. Um, I think we covered the, um, the lots of past and present of, of your business. So um, I also want to hear about the future plans of sure. your business. Yes. So uh, what are your future plans, uh, future business plans in Japan? Mm. Well, um, without making any forward looking statements, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> So mo most, most Japanese companies are aiming to exit through IPO. So mergers and acquisitions, known as M&A, &A, M &A, with my accent, M&A, is, uh, is vanishingly rare, very few in Japan. Um, I think the biggest M&A deal I've seen was, I think, Soracom, 
acquired by KDDI for about $200 million. And that's pretty good. Um, but I mean, if you look at, well, you look at a lot of the acquisitions in the United States, these are billion dollar acquisitions. So you can get quite yeah. big. Um, for us, if we were, you know, we are aiming for IPO. We don't know when exactly. Um, there's obviously been a rush on IPOs, especially in fintech. Uh, you know, recently companies like Wealth Navi IPO'd, uh, Free and Money Forward already IPO'd. There's a few more coming down the line. We, for us, it's it's not about oh let's you know let's become a listed company because it's a lot of a lot of tema tema in Japanese. Kazuki san, you know what that is, but it means um, kind of like the pain in the butt, <laughs> friction. Um, it's a great word. So it's it's a lot of it's a lot of extra work. But for us, why would we do that? One is so that the, when people see our name embedded inside someone else's app, providing access to the data, they they recognize us as a company that is subject to audit is subject to internal controls that provides transparency that has outside board members not just some random people on the internet asking for your information and you don't know who they are so that we have accountability and, and transparency it's also a, a, a way to uh, obviously raise a lot of capital for future growth it's probably the best way to do it in japan at the moment so an ipo is definitely something that we're looking at in the future um, in terms of the company itself you know we have staff in australia we have staff in japan we've gone we went full remote about a year ago. So we were very, very early. Um, you know, we, we saw what was happening with coronavirus. Uh, we'd heard some whispers out of government that, you know, <laughs> what was going on in January, actually, late January. And we're like, okay, this is, this is going to be serious. Why do we need people to come to the office? I mean, we're, it was very easy for us to make the switch for most teams. Sales team were very concerned until they realized that they could, and this was great. Oh, this was great. This is a great story. So <laughs> let's just rewind the tape a little bit. For years, I was very jealous of startups in America who could just get on a WebEx, which is an old type of thing. It's like Zoom or Google Meet, but for big companies. And they could get on a WebEx and just meet customers in 50 states and barely ever meet with them in person and maybe fly there to close the deal. And I thought, wow, that's so efficient. And around that time, there was a company called Bellface and they had these ads in the taxis in Japan. It was like, it's ordo ego, like it's old sales. And there's this guy with these like great calf muscles and he's like sales is a thing that you do with your legs <laughs> like, this is hilarious because i've actually gone on sales calls like to the countryside in a past life for a japanese company where we did exactly that we're like walking up hills and like how is this ever going to lead to anything and it didn't lead to anything but the guy who was training me was like this is this is sales I'm like i've done that and so start of february last year not a single bank in japan would meet with us online zero start from starting March last year, almost 100%. And some of them were like, yes, we can meet online, but we have to go to the to corporate office to actually get on because our, our, our VPN won't let us in or he won't let us run this. You know, we can't do it from outside. And so little by little, everyone who's been resisting adopting modern technology is now forced to adopt it. And many of them are becoming, you know, very, very avid and enthusiastic adopters. And so all of a sudden we can do all these things. And so our sales team, this is where we came in, realized that they can get a lot more sales calls done because they're not traveling everywhere. We, we had someone go to uh, Gifu Ken the other day, Nagoya, Gifu around there. And uh, I was like, wow, you, you're going in person? I mean, because being there in person is a lot better, but that's like the first one in a long, long time that we've had it in, across all of our sales teams. So that is a great thing. And so in terms of the topic of today, right, we've talked about, what's changing in the in the workplace work style. Japan is becoming more like everywhere else in terms of the kinds of technologies it's willing to adapt to. And I've got a very interesting theory on this, right? So well, I think it's interesting. You tell me what you think in the comments. In countries like Australia and America, I'm from Australia, we're really bad at following process, like terrible as it, I mean, it's just cultural in Australia, I think. I, I had to get really good at it living here. <laughs> I wasn't raised doing that. So we need software to keep us on the straight and narrow, like guardrails, so we don't go off the, you know, don't, don't drive the car off the, off the road, right? In Japan, people are very good at following, at following those processes, super good, like the best in the world. That's why, you know, Japan has been so good at manufacturing. That's why Japanese customer service is great when it follows that process, or motenashi. But we have another problem in Japan now that we've never had. So the population is getting smaller. 
you know, the, the working, the people who are available to work, the work age population is dwindling. And so even though we've been able to resist information technology for so long, now we can't. So there's this one time, like I think once in a generation or once in history, boom, around SaaS software. So software as a service. We're, I think there will be hundreds of SaaS companies built in Japan. And at some point they'll probably consolidate, but there's so many opportunities to build a SaaS business because everyone needs to adopt modern software tools and the lowest risk, highest bang for a buck way to do that is to use SaaS. And so, you know, you look at companies like Free who've raised a lot of money uh, to do accounting software in the cloud. Um, you look at companies like Base who, you know, worth, they were worth $200 million when they IPO'd and six months later they were worth like $2 billion because because of coronavirus and they, they do e-commerce uh, software as a service so people can run shops online. These are companies that are building the infrastructure of the future. I mean, this is the future of Japan. And it doesn't replace existing infrastructure entirely. You know, the NTTs aren't going to go away. IBM won't disappear, but it builds on top. So technologies like geographic, uh, geological sediments, like layers of, you know, you've got the different eras of history with different, like, you know, dinosaurs are down here and little, little mammals are up here. And, you know, this is where the people start to appear. So it's like that. And so Money Tree as well, we're building a platform that other people can build their, their products and services on, including, including banks. And so the work culture will adapt to that, meaning more flexible. You know, Japan has been famous for having you know, very strict work culture. Uh, the fushu or the, the conventions of Japanese business, you know, showing your, your meishi and all these other things, these will transform. So in a Zoom meeting, I still bow. It's like bowing on the telephone. Come on, if you speak Japanese, you bow on the phone. I got it messed up. But you know, I bow on, on a Zoom call or on a Google Meet call or Teams call because I wanted to see that I'm earnest, just like I'd be there in, in person. So it doesn't change completely, but it's becoming more flexible. I think Japan is willing to deal with more diversity, which is what we've needed and what we'll continue to need for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, the world is becoming remote and the digital. Like you can do the business and work anywhere in the world, right? So um, my friends in the UK are working at the VC. Uh, she said she is her VC is investing uh, without like a face-to-face -face meeting. So then these days, um, yeah, kind of a all remote and digital. So like not only startups, but VCs are also going like digital. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Okay, so uh, maybe we can uh, move on to the Q&A session. So okay. those of you uh, who aren't, uh, 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 who didn't join at the beginning, uh, there's a Q&A box right next to the comment section. So you can post a key, uh, your question here. Okay. So I, uh, I I <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, I'll pick up this question. So what advice would you give, uh, give you US startups who are looking to establish their first Japan presence? In your opinion, which US startups are successfully launching in Japan? Mm -hmm. All right, that's a good question. Um, let me answer this indirectly so japan is a high commitment market on the one hand it's you know there are fewer companies trying to do the same thing here you, you, in india china us there's a lot of contention in every in every vertical in japan there's less but things are slower um, adoption takes longer even with the change that's happening the change is happening now it hasn't happened um, so you have to understand that if you're coming to Japan, you need to commit three to five years. Not, oh, it didn't work in two years, we're gonna pull out. You, know, you can't think it's gonna be uh, a fast, uh, that it's gonna just be a fast turnaround and bang, within 18 months, you're doing great. It will take surprisingly, a, a surprising long time, <laughs> a long, long time to get there. Some of our deals take three years to go from pitch to sale to launch. And that's two years of, some of them were two years of pitching <laughs> and then a year of preparing. So you have to have really a lot of patience. Um, there are different ways to approach the market though. Um, 
So a couple of ways to look at this. One, I'll give you an example of three different companies that I've seen in the SaaS space that have come here and the, the ways that they've approached it. So one is uh, Monday.com. They do an Asana uh, style workflow pro product, although I really should say Monday.com style product because I think they were the first ones to turn it into a workflow uh, you know, task management system for the, for the enterprise. Um, so Monday.com. Another one is Wix. And actually, what was the third one that I liked it? See if I can remember the third one. But Monday.com, the way they came to the market is they just started selling it in English. And then at some point, they had enough interest in it uh, from companies that would adopt in English that I think they found a partner in, in Japan who would push it for them and even translated it for them. So that's organic through digital advertising. Um, I think we were one of their first customers in Japan. <laughs> So it worked for us because it was in English. And then at some point we realized it was in Japanese, but they were targeting many, many different markets as well. Um, so that's that's one way to enter the market. A company like Wix, I don't know if they have people here, but they've been, you know, they're a company that's very heavy on digital advertising spend. Um, and they try to, you know, they lock you in pretty well to their product. So with Wix, I don't think they needed to come to Japan, but they did need to have something that was just directly transferable to this market without much behavior change. So they do web, uh, website management um, and I've heard that they've been re I've seen a lot of their ads so I imagine they've got some success so there are two examples of how you would come to the market um, the traditional way is this you you find a Japanese systems integration company an SI company and you do a deal with them and they put their margin on top and they go and sell it to a few companies and if that works great and then they probably don't try that hard because they've got so many different things to sell if they find that it's easy to sell, they'll keep selling it. Um, and so that's that's a traditional path. I don't know how successful that, that will be for a lot of companies. If you want to just say, you know, we sell in Japan, that's the best way to do that. But to really be here and, you know, the tip, the, the proper way is to is to send someone out here, hire, you know, hire locally, spend a couple of years working out who's going to use your product, have enough development resources in your home market to... Uh, to make those changes, prioritize it enough because your home market will always want to take all of the resources. So, because, you know, of course they still have so many people to sell to and so many features that need developing. And then why for Japan? Who cares? You know, that's a stupid idea. We'd never do that. And so without knowing the context of why Japanese customers might, might want something, it's going to be this whole push me, pull you relationship between what Japan will need and what the home market needs. I think one one company, one one person that's done interesting things is Alan Miner. Uh, it used to be called Sunbridge, but now I think it's Japan Cloud. They've brought a bunch of already very successful things to Japan. Um, they brought Salesforce to Japan early on. Um, they also brought Concur. And typically, what they do is, you know, they they would it was like an incubator model. So they would have shared office space. Obviously, the knowledge that Alan has from having been in the market for forty years. So I think he originally brought Oracle to Japan as a, as an employee in, in the nineteen eighties. Um, and they've raised a ton of money now as well from what I can, from what I see. <laughs> so that, you know, I think they're going to do a bit more of that as Japan cloud. So there's always also that model if you're already a big successful company, but look, you, I think you can do it bottom up, but it really depends on what your product is and how, how directly, how directly it can be mapped to Japan. If it's not so direct, like task tracking, pretty direct, um, website management, pretty direct. But then if you've got something like HR management software, a whole lot less direct because there's so much localization that will be needed. Accounting software, almost impossible to bring from another market to Japan. Um, there's all lots of, lots of different other types. So you've got to think about where your software sits on the specialization, gen generalization sort of spectrum. Does that answer the question well enough? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, that's a great point. Yeah, uh, I think I will pick up one more question. Uh, I think it's from Megan. Uh, I have seen references to being a startup founder. It's similar to playing a game. So do you agree? Why? Why not? <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah, that was written by a non-founder. <laughs> okay, if the game is Running Man, yes. You, you remember Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger where you're running for your life inside a huge game and if you, you lose, they, they kill you? like you die. I think it was based on a Stephen King book. It's really now it's an old, old movie. But if the game is running, man, yes. Um, startup founders are typically running for their lives in some in some cases. I mean, they're not going to kill you, but I hope. <laughs> not, not that I've seen. Um, but no, I, I don't think it's like a game. 
Um, think about what a startup founder has at risk. So you may have some. You may have sunk your own capital into your business. If you want to make something work, you've got to be prepared to give at least ten years of your life to make that work. And we're in our, we're actually in our tenth year at Money Tree. We've done nine already, and that's not including the two years I did uh, with my co-founders, just making apps, trying to figure out how that works. Um, so it's been a long time since I worked for someone else. <laughs> actually, now I work for everyone. I work for my staff. I work for my investors. I work for my clients. I work for the public's expectations. As CEO, you work for everyone. If you're a founder, you work for you kind of work for everyone. <laughs> so you know that's probably the right way to think about it. But what you have at risk is your own capital. You have your your youth or your, your you know the years spent doing something. Um, you typically will go without for a long time. Like okay, I can't invest in I can't invest in Bitcoin because all my money is in Money Tree, or you know I can't buy a house because I don't have enough of a salary for many years, you know, for a bunch of years. And it, sometimes it goes down and up because, you know, the pro, you know the prospects of the company at different times in the past with money tree, I had, so it went down, it went down for a bit. That's not compatible with like having a home loan, for example. Um, can't have holidays, can't have all these different things because, you, you know, it's very hard to let go and just take that time. And every time you think, oh, I'm gonna have a holiday now, it gets cut short by something. So there's a lot of sacrifice. And I'm not saying this to, to make anyone feel sorry for me, or for any other founder, but if you are a founder or you're thinking about being one, think about what you're going to sacrifice, because it will it will eat away at you at some at, you know it will make you think should I be doing this? Am I wasting my time? Is this going to go somewhere? And there is a constant feeling of everyone else is doing better than me. Everyone else is raising money more easily than I am, and you have to remember that's false because everyone does it hard. Although some people do it less hard than you, but that's life. And you probably do it easier than some. <laughs> someone, you know, someone, you may be doing it hard, but someone else couldn't even get there. You know, they, it didn't work. Their dream didn't work. Their, their idea wasn't good enough. Their pitch wasn't good enough. They weren't charming enough. They didn't make the right number of sales calls. They couldn't convince the great engineers to join them. They couldn't keep their team together. They couldn't control their ego. I mean, there's all sorts of things. But I don't think it's a game because in a game, you don't really sacrifice that much. I mean, if you're a professional athlete, you're sacrificing a lot and you could sacrifice your health. You could, I mean, in some cases, your life, if you get injured and, uh, you know, I think there's some NFL players who've been killed on the field through, you know, or neck injuries, been paralyzed. So it's more like being a professional athlete, except, <laughs> except that the path to success is a lot less certain because everyone's path is, a, is pretty unique. I mean, you're banking on the fact that you're kind of unique. So... No, I don't think it's like a game. I, I think it's I think it's a very very challenging. If you want to be rich, if you want to have credit, if you want to have instant credibility, you know, go join a company that will give that to you straight away. Like if you work with some of the big tech companies, um, like Amazon or Google, they're paying a lot of money and their stock goes up very. Uh, they go goes up a lot, but you're going to be working on a button at a big company, or you go to a startup to really make change in the world. Like big companies need people to work on buttons. Unfortunately, Money Tree will be in that position one day too. So we have to create new businesses and new lines and do new interesting things. And there are people who will work on those buttons and they'll make great buttons. And a button is important. And when I say a button, I mean it's one small piece of the whole. That's the new that's the equivalent of the cog, right? You're not a cog. You work on a cog, you work on a button. But in a small company, you have to do everything. And it's different, it's not better, because we need both. And some appeal to some and not others. For my personality. At least how it was. I like working on new things. I like having impact. And so, even though it's tempting to be like, "Oh, I could work at this company maybe and get this salary and get these stock options," and people will go, "Oh, you work there? That's great." Well, that isn't quite what they're not quite the incentives I, I that that I wanted. So it's not a game. It's definitely about sacrifice. Don't feel sorry for startup founders. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong in not joining a startup and deciding to work in another company where you're doing something important, but you're only working on a small part of it and your ability to, to impact the whole is just from size is just way less. But no, not again. Unless it's Running Man. Go see it. It's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> so old. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time. So yeah, we are doing this kind of events uh, the regularly and also like a poll is doing the clubhouse so you can you guys can ask questions on clubhouse maybe 
<laughs> yeah, so tonight at 9.30, um, founded in Japan. I'm doing, I've been doing it every Monday night for a couple of weeks now. We'll see how long it goes for. I'm calling in all my uh, my startup friends and for favors to <laughs> to, to join and share, share their thoughts. Um, tonight we have uh, Tim Romero. He's the head of Google for startups in Japan. And he's also the man behind the Disrupting Japan podcasts. I think he's he's met more. Thanks, John. For your, I just want to shout out to John on the chat. Thanks, John. Um, Tim Romero, who's joining tonight, uh, I think he's interviewed more Japanese startups uh, than most people have had hot dinners. He's been doing it for six years, so it'll be pretty interesting. And uh, you're welcome to come up on the stage. And because it's Clubhouse, you just ask the question when we bring you up. Um, so 9:30 tonight. Hope to see some of you there. Okay. So lastly, um, I think some of the entrepreneurs and the people who wants to start the business in Japan are watching this, and they will be watching this because this session will be uploaded on right. YouTube and Startup Grind website. So uh, can I give, um, give them a piece of advice or uh, the messages for uh, the audience? Sure. Um, okay. hmm. For people wanting to start up businesses in Japan, if you're not Japanese, make sure you have people who are culturally and linguistically fluent. Lingu linguistically fluent. That's, we should just edit that one. I'll start again. <laughs> you can edit it, right? Um, okay. So for people who are starting up in Japan, if you're not from Japan, make sure you have people on your team who are culturally fluent, linguistically fluent with a, a language here. It's important. It's This is not Singapore. But there are unique things that make it a great market to start in. Um, don't expect things to happen straight away, but there's a lot of opportunity. Japan has a big need for innovation, for diversity, and the ecosystem is changing a lot. When I, uh, when I started Money Tree, I'd say between seed and series A round, one investor said to me, well, if you run out of money, you know, your, your reputations will be toast. So you probably won't be able to start a business in Japan, but you could probably go somewhere else. I think today it would be understood that, you know, if that happened, uh, to a startup, I don't think it's going to happen to us. If it happened to a startup, that that you know, as long as you did everything right and transparently and didn't waste money and you know, spend it on ridiculous things, um, that you did everything earnestly and transparently with your investors, that some of those investors would probably want to invest in you again. So I, I think that's that's a measure of where the ecosystem here has got to. So that that's my my advice for people starting up in Japan. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Paul, uh, for joining okay. the event. And the thank you for the audience. So please check uh, House at uh, uh, 9.30 tonight. Thanks, <laughs> Kaluki. All right. <laughs> All right, maybe see you at the Clubhouse then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, DM All me right. on Twitter if, uh, if you need an invite. I've got a few extra ones. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Kazuki. Thanks, Megan.